What does it mean, as we've heard before, to be a black man who loves his country, even if it doesn't love him back in equal measure? What a despicable, hateful man. Joe Biden's got some real problems for re-election coming up this November if he doesn't nail down a couple of key voting blocks that Democrats always can count on. In fact, some could argue they always take for granted. And one of them that they're very concerned about, black men. African-American male voters right now are leaving Joe Biden in droves. They're saying that they're either not going to support him or they're just saying, yeah, I'm going to vote for Trump because, well, things were better under Trump. Biden does nothing. In fact, Biden has made things worse. So he has to shore up that support. He decided to go to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, to give the commencement address and address black voters in that august, historically black college. And well, the way he addressed them was basically to pander to them, lie to them, and divide our country along racial lines. Because, well, he's Joe Biden. That's just what he does. First, a quick clip to show you how clueless and out of it he is. In fact, take a look at his face there. I mean, he has no idea where he is and what he's doing there. Why am I wearing this thing? Am I singing in the choir? What is this? Where am I? Who is that man with the presidential seal at the podium? Oh, it's my good, funny, good, good buddy, Barack. Barack, why are you dressed like that? Here's Joe Biden being very confused at the Morehouse College commencement address, and he hears the speaker call for an immediate ceasefire, a permanent ceasefire in Israel, and Joe Biden applauds. It is my stance as a Morehouse man, nay, as a human being, to call for an immediate and a permanent ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. Now, that would be Joe Biden, the president of the United States, the commander in chief of the American military and the leader of the free world, applauding a policy that is not anything near the American policy. His American policy. His policy is not to call for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Israel. The last thing that the Joe Biden, Biden administration would demand is a permanent ceasefire. Why would you have a permanent ceasefire? in the middle of a war. Of course, that is not our position, and but <laughs> there he is applauding it. Why? Well, if you watch it with the sound down, you can tell that he, in fact, is not paying attention. Look at his face. He has no idea where he is. He has no idea what he's doing. He actually starts to nod off there for a moment. He may be pooping his pants, for all we know. He's done it before. And then all of a sudden, everybody applauds. So he realizes, oh, people are clapping. I guess I got to clap, too. That's your president applauding a policy that is actually contrary to his own policy. Uh, then came the pandering. Oh, and the best pandering that he does is when he panders and lies at the same time. Here he is talking about how many Morehouse men are in the White House. I got more Morehouse men in the White House telling me what to do than I know what to do. <laughs> you all think I'm kidding, don't you? <laughs> you know I'm not. And it's the best thing that's happened to me. Yeah, you all think I'm kidding. No, we don't think you're kidding. We just think you're a dirty liar. Because, in fact, there are no Morehouse men in the White House. There are no graduates of any kind in the White House telling Joe Biden what to do. In fact, the last graduate of Morehouse College, the closest he got was to be the communications director for Kamala Harris, uh, whose office, the communications director at least, their office is not in the White House. And the communications director for the vice president certainly does not tell the president what to do. Uh, that was one of many communications directors for Kamala Harris, by the way. His name was Jamal Simmons. Uh, he left like all the other communications directors for Kamala Harris because, well, if you were a communications director for Kamala Harris, well, you'd leave too. So while he was lying and while he was pandering to the graduates at Morehouse, some of them literally turned their back on him. All hope was lost. In our lives, in the lives of the nation, we have those Saturdays to bear witness the day before glory. All 
Yep. That man got up when the speech began, turned his chair around and specifically looked the other way and gave his back to the president. Uh, some people actually got up and walked out of the speech. Uh, the problem is it was for all the wrong reasons, for all the reasons why people should protest this president and turn your back on him and not listen to a word he says as he lies, divides, and panders to this black audience for solely political purposes. Uh, they picked the wrong reason, the policy in Israel, because, well, they're pro-terrorists, sadly. Uh, but it was definitely a tepid response from the crowd there. Every time he said a line that was going to be a big applause line, for the most part, it was a smattering at best. I got a couple of lines in there. Um, here he is speaking to the Morehouse College graduates about how he circumvented the Constitution. He brags about it, in fact. As long as it's for paying back people's student loans, ah, what Constitution? Supreme Court said, no, I'm going to do it anyway. You go, Joe. That's great. Who needs a, a Constitution and separation of power? And the Supreme Court told me I couldn't. I found two other ways to do it. How, how is this something that he should brag about? I mean, and by the way, where's all the media about the constitutional crisis? Remember when Donald Trump was trying to figure out a way through executive action to pay for the building of the wall? It's a constitu constitutional crisis, day 312. America held hostage. We have a constitutional crisis. Donald Trump is trying to take defense spending and use it to defend the country. Remember, he asked for funding for the wall. Nancy Pelosi said, hell no. So he went ahead and found money in the defense budget and said, well, let's use this for the wall because, you know, building a border wall is kind of the nation's defense. And that was a constitutional crisis. Here we have a Supreme Court decision. It made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, no, you cannot unilaterally refund student loan debt. Even Nancy Pelosi had said, that he can't unilaterally refund student loan debt and forgive student loan debt. And now he's bragging about the fact that he figured out two ways to do it around the Supreme Court's decision. And we're supposed to applaud this. Well, because lawlessness and unconstitutional activity is actually a virtue if you're a Democrat. But it's an impeachable offense if you're a Republican. Those are the rules. I didn't make them up. I just comment on them. Today in Georgia, they won't allow water to be available to you while you wait in line to vote in an election. What in the hell is that all about? I'm serious. Oh, the I'm serious, I'm not joking thing is always the tell. When Joe Biden stops and looks at the audience, goes off script and says, I'm serious, he's lying. I'd love to play poker with this guy. I want to raise you $300. I'm sitting on a full house. I'm serious. Oh, all in. Show me your cards, buddy. What he just said is a flat out lie. It's a flat out lie that they've been saying for years, and it's been thoroughly debunked. There are no laws keeping people from getting water while they're waiting in line to vote. What you can't do when people are waiting in line is to deliver anything to them on behalf of a political organization, because that would be politicking. Here's a bottle of water for you, compliments of the Democratic Party of Georgia. Don't forget to vote. That you can't do. And by the way, how insulting. These are college graduates from Morehouse College. They've just gotten their degree. And he thinks so little of them that he thinks they're going to buy that crap, that they don't know the truth, something that has been thoroughly debunked. He, he thinks they will believe his lie because he is, in fact, racist. They won't know any better. As long as I make them angry about white men, they'll applaud me. And, and, and one other thing. I just got to say, this whole thing, you can't bring up. No one can bring you a bottle of water while you're waiting in line to vote in Georgia. It's outrageous. It's not true. We just had an election there. There were no, in fact, there was higher black turnout in the last election after the voter integrity laws got passed than there was before the voter integrity laws got passed. And nobody died of dehydration because here's the thing. 
every single one of those graduates from Morehouse, those black voters that he's trying to piss off and, and tur turn on white Republicans, every single one of them, while they're sitting there, probably has their own Yeti or Stanley full of water. Every single person of that generation doesn't go anywhere without a bottle of water of some kind. This is the most hydrated generation in world history. They can't ever bring you a bottle of water. It's like, yeah, that's okay, dude. I, I got a jug here. I take it everywhere I go. And by the way, I got a better idea. Why don't you do so? You know who runs the voting in Atlanta? You know who, you know, all these lines in Fulton County. Who's in charge of vote, voting in Fulton County? Democrats. Yeah, I have a better idea, guys. Why don't you get rid of the lines? Why don't you stop with the, why don't you add more polling places? Why don't you get more people to work at the polls? Instead, you've got people lined up around the block because you have no infrastructure. You haven't actually cared about the voting process. Of course, that goes all the way back to the Democrats' Jim Crow days. And now he's insulting these students by lying to them, by lying to them. But it's not just a lie. It's a lie specifically designed to further inflame racial tensions. And, and this next clip you're about to see is so despicable and so disgusting and so hateful of America. Look at his face. Look at that face. I want you to listen to what this man is about to say while recognizing that he is the president of the United States. He is the leader of this country. And listen, watch what little regard he has for the nation he is supposed to lead. Listen to the contempt he holds for this country. It's natural to wonder if democracy you hear about actually works for you. What is democracy? If black men are being killed in the street, what is democracy? The trail of broken promises still leave black, black communities behind. What is democracy? You have to be 10 times better than anyone else to get a fair shot. Most of all, what does it mean? As we've heard before, to be a black man who loves his country, even if it doesn't love him back in equal measure. There was your smattering of four people applauding Dr. Jill, Karine Jean-Pierre, and their dates. What a despicable, hateful man. That anyone who would deliver those remarks and say that about this country has no regard for this country. Joe Biden hates America. And, and this is all meant to gather support among these black voters. This is his strategy. Oh, we're losing support amongst black voters. So let's go out and tell them how racist the country is. And this is a commencement address. Can you imagine being the parent of a child who is just getting their college degree? And you're hoping to hear a speech of uh, uplifting advice and, and inspiring words that that send you off into your life now as a college graduate ready to seize the world and make a difference and build a family and and build a career and do something meaningful and important and instead you get this guy saying you guys don't have a chance I and mean, you're all black i mean if they don't kill you they're gonna trample all over you in the professional world because this country hates you It is one of the most despicable things I've ever heard. And that's saying something from this man. But this has been his entire career. Think about this for a minute. Because he just said decades of broken promises. And I, who made those promises, Joe Biden? The, if, if you were to believe Joe Biden about the racist state of the United States of America, circa 2024, as he just described, isn't it fair for us to ask, Joe, what have you done about it? You have been a United States senator, the vice president, and now the president for 52 years. You started your public life in 1972. And after 52 years, this is the state of affairs? Can we not hold you responsible for that? What have you done to improve things? 
This man, at every point in his career, if given the opportunity, has divided this country along racial lines. That's what he learned in the 70s as a Democrat, and it's what he's continued to do. From his treatment to Clarence Thomas, to when, as vice president, claiming in front of a black audience that Mitt Romney was going to put you all back in chains, the lie about Charlottesville that he claims was the reason why he decided to run in 2020, and now this? This is despicable. And again, I want to reiterate, insulting to the young men and women, 22, 23 years old, in that audience who really do know better. And that's why you hear hardly any of them applauding. Then he turns to the so-called book ban. I love it when Democrats talk about a book ban. A book ban, they're banning books, you know, they're banning books. When you hear about the book ban, what do you think of? You think about the gay porn, right? I mean, the books that conservatives mostly, but also Democrats as well, when they actually see what's in the books, the books in question that are at the center of the so-called fake book ban controversy, where parents are trying to use their judgment and discern whether it is age appropriate to have explicit gay pornography in the hands of children That's what the left calls a book ban. But all the books involve the same kind of content. It's all, you know, gay porn. So the speechmakers are putting together this speech in front of Morehouse College, and I'm sure somebody said, hey, maybe we should say something about the book ban too. And then one of the people says, oh, yeah, I love the book ban thing. It it makes Trump and the conservatives look like Nazis. That's wonder. You're right. We should throw it in there. But here's the problem. That's about gay porn. It doesn't have anything to do with race. And the other speechwriter said, ah, screw it. It doesn't matter. Just say that it's about race. Go ahead. Talk about the book ban, but say that it's about race. Let's see if that works. So that's what they did. I never thought when I was graduating in 1968, as your honoree just was, we talked about, I never thought I'd be in a a present of time when there's a national effort to ban books, not to write history, but to erase history. They don't see you in the future of America, but they're wrong. To me, we make history, not erase it. Uh, Joe Biden is an angry, angry, bitter man who shouted vitriol at these college graduates at Morehouse, thinking that this is the way to get black votes. And listen, he may be right. I will never underestimate a white Democrat's ability to divide America along racial lines for political gain. They have a very, very long history of doing this very effectively. But I want to hope and I want to pray that we've moved past this kind of crap. That we've moved past these lies, this division. What a unifier he is. Oh, and then finally, as uh, he was finished with his speech, He's yucking it up with the administration there at Morehouse. And uh, take a look. He doesn't want to leave the stage, he claims, right? I'm not going home. There you go. Oh, by the way, did you notice everyone? No one's standing in the audience. He's done with his speech. Look at how everyone's still in their seats. Uh, They gave him his little thing. They're doing the whole presentation. He goes back to the podium. He says he's not going home. (laughs) He's not going home. He loves it there so much. Actually, the next thing you know, he did go home. He actually went home while the ceremony was still going on. While someone was uh, performing and inspiring the students instead of shouting racial lies at them, he got up and made a big show. He left the stage. And I ain't got weary yet. I ain't got weary yet. I ain't got weary yet. That performance actually sounds a lot better and more interesting than anything Joe Biden did. I mean, that, I would have stayed for that. How insulting and how rude and what a jerk 
while this beautiful performance is going on with that incredible voice to just get up and say, ah, I'm done. I did what I needed. I got what I wanted. So I'm out of here. He's an awful human being. Absolutely awful. And by the way, if you want any further proof about what a despicable, divisive, uh, racist performance this was down at Morehouse, well, let's ask an expert on such matters. How do you think the president did at Morehouse? I thought it was a very good speech. Uh, I thought that he really made some very key points, including uh, his outright call for an immediate ceasefire. But I also think where he listed uh, things like the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, the Voting Rights Act, specific things about how black unemployment is down in, a, uh, in terms of record unemployment. Uh, so it was a substantive speech and it was inspirational. And it was uh, at a place that many of us uh, see as sacred ground. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. came from Morehouse among many others. And I thought it was the place to do it. I thought the students protested. It was a small amount, but they did it with the dignity that did not scar the school, but at the same time respected the graduation. So I thought it was a, a win-win for both the students and for the president. How do you think? Well, there you go. It's got the Al Sharpton seal of approval. So you know that it was hateful and racist and divisive and incoherent and moronic because that's the Al Sharpton brand. Like I said, it may work, but it sure feels like when this kind of divisive racist rhetoric is delivered and the likes of Al Sharpton approves of it, seems like they're running a race in 1992 not 2024. I'd like to hope that not just the American people, but black Americans after what they've been through for the last eight, 10 years, that they know better. I actually respect their intelligence more than Joe Biden and Al Sharpton does, because there's one part of Al Sharpton's analysis that's really revealing. When he says, I'm glad President Biden was frank and really talked about the issues like how black unemployment is down right now. Funny, four years ago, black unemployment was the lowest it's ever been since we've been keeping track of unemployment along racial lines. That's like 50 years. Under President Trump, black unemployment had reached its lowest level ever. And now under Joe Biden, as Al Sharpton just pointed out, black unemployment is in a really bad place. I mean, what's different? Oh, yeah. Joe Biden. So he's getting praise for going up and acknowledging the unemployment crisis among black Americans that he single-handedly created. I mean, I guess it's good when you're a Democrat and you can get praise for actually creating the chaos that you're now at least honest enough in front of that audience to acknowledge.